We are in the last days, John. Amen. We are in Revelation 12, 17 Amen. right now. Now, this, this uh, Rainer, uh, this top Jesuit Rainer, in his strategy for the unification of the churches, says that actually the only requirement is that these other churches not reject out of hand an explicit doctrine of the Catholic Church as being irreconcilable with the fundamental substance of, Christ, of their Christianity. The development of ecclesiastical consciousness in all the churches has progressed to such an extent that this is possible. Now that is a statement their leaders. astoundingly like the statement that Malachi Martin makes about how the Jesuits knew when the time had come to strike in Eastern Europe because all of these bishops had been prepared right. to accept Everybody the, had pope. been prepared. And the right. Seventh Avenue people are being prepared for this massive blow of Catholicism to bring us to into, receive the mark of the to beast. To receive the mark of the beast. Bob, let me just ask you, I have several things written down here on this pad. I want to talk about the traditions or the techniques of modern warfare, and I want to also talk about how New Age and mysticism plays into this complete strategy of preparing the Seventh-day Adventist people for receiving the mark of the beast. Okay. John, could we, could, could we hit that one on NLP chronologically? Yes. I want to go through the rest of the 80s. I just want to make and sure that we don't if, miss it. If we're dipping a little too much into the Jesuit strategy here, we can get back on with the chronological development in the 80s. Would you like to do that? Maybe, Bob. Maybe. Okay. maybe but maybe what I'm saying here, maybe I just slipped something in on our Adventist people watching this that they right. didn't realize. Okay. This is all heading towards God's Seventh-day Adventist people receiving the mark of the beast. Exactly. I guess maybe this is the first time we have come right out and said this. Folks, this all is a plan for... Seventh-day Adventists to receive the mark of the beast. That's where all this is heading. You know, we're laying the foundation here in this whole, uh, seeing this whole strategy, and the end result is that Seventh-day Adventists receive the mark of the beast. That's where all this That's is heading. That's what the devil wants. That's where all this is heading. Exactly. Um, incidentally, the Jesuit also calls for, he says that the churches now have become so liberal in their thinking that they're prepared to slough off most of their doctrines. And this is one of the most effective things in bringing about unity. Boredom, he says, is also a, a critical element. And most people will be bored with most of their doctrines and they'll push them aside. Now, that gives us a little taste anyway. We haven't, there's loads more that could be said about the Jesuit strategy. But in 1985, this book, The Church is Charismatic, came out from the World Council of Churches. It deals... So, the Pentecostal movement speaking in tongues is endorsed as the common denominator of the World Council of Churches. Oh, yes. Now, I just want to make sure our people understand that. Uh, page one. The charismatic renewal can be seen as a Christian variation of a worldwide religious revival. Page 21. The charismatic renewal has the potential to extend the contemporary ecumenical movement to communities within Christendom which so far have kept aloof from the development of ecumenism. Now this is 1985 when this comes out. They come right out in public and they say that now the charismatic renewal has the potential for penetrating churches that the ecumenical movement has not yet been able to penetrate. You see, when the Jesuits move in on a church, they have this whole hierarchical approach of working from the top down, but it is also necessary, according to Rayner, to gain for each church entity, each leadership of each church, to gain a majority of its members to be in support of the drive for unity. You just said something I want to go back to and I want to make sure that our Adventist people understand this, that the Jesuit uh, plan of attack and the method for getting uh, infiltrating any denomination is to start at the top mm -hmm. and come down. Not start with the laity and come up, but to start with, to infiltrate the leadership and then to let it trickle down. That is very important because that's exactly what we see happening in the Seventh Avenue Church. Would you like a, a case in point if by the official theological censor? I'd love to hear it. Okay, <laughs> I have another book here. Now listen, do I need to start getting some of these books off, Bob? You need to... 
Need some uh, more room. Right. You some, need room. Some of them I'm still, unless you think there's As you're bringing too many books over, I'll just start loading them off on the floor <laughs> here. So you just keep bringing those books over. This is by B.G. Wilkinson. Oh. Used to be president of the Missionary. Heart. Amen. A historic he, Adventist. And he uncovered a, a Jesuit. Most historic Adventists know the story. Uh, and incidentally, it's been just reconfirmed by the man who was at that time academic dean of Washington Missionary College. When he was uh, president of Washington Missionary College, what was this, in the 40s? Uh, yeah, 30s and 40s. So he uncovered a Jesuit on staff, a professor on uh, staff then. That's right. Bless his heart. Right, and at, in the early 40s, a friend of my mother told me on the te telephone of her experience, uh, she and her husband lived in the married student housing and incidentally, we have a, a tape and call, called The Witnesses where this, she tells this story. Yeah. Gallen Verity, a Roman Catholic priest, was baptized into our church, professed conversion, got into the theological studies, but every night he had to, at 9 o'clock, report on the telephone. And her husband understood Spanish and understood what he was saying. Ultimately, he was uncovered. Yeah. And well, uh, there's a whole string of them that we could tell about. We have had some experiences right here in this ministry of uh, Roman Catholics that converted to, to uh, Adventism in their adult life. And uh, I will be very honest with you, it'll be a long time before I put a converted Roman Catholic that has been born and raised in the Catholic system and educated in the Catholic system and converted to Adventism in their adult life, it'll be a long time before I put them into a leadership position in this church and ministry again. Listen to this. This is from D Dr. De Sanctis, who for many years was a priest at Rome, professor of theology, official, official theological censor of the Inquisition, and who later became a Protestant. He tells of his interview with the secretary of the French father assistant of the Jesuit order. Here's what he said. They were having trouble infiltrating the English church. Quote, the English clergy were formerly too much attached to their articles of faith to be shaken from them. And he said you might, as, might have employed in vain all the machines set in motion by Bousset and the Jansenists of France to reunite them to the Romish church. And so the Jesuits of England tried another plan. This was to demonstrate from history and ecclesiastical antiquity the legitimacy of the usages of the English church, whence through the exertions of the Jesuits concealed among its clergy might arise a studious attention to Christian antiquity. Jesuits, Jesuits concealed among its clergy. That, that's it. Tell me something, Bob. Do you believe that there would be any attempt for the Jesuits to infiltrate the independent ministries? Would you that know, sound John, logical to you, Bob? It would be the most logical thing in the world. <laughs> it would be the most logical thing because what they want to do is to silence any voice raised Absolutely. against Rome. Absolutely. In fact, the Catholic uh, Campaign for America, which was just launched a few weeks ago, had as one of its primary objectives to silence anyone speaking out against Rome. So back to this, uh, this church's charismatic... Uh, document here in 1985 the world council of churches says now we can use the charismatic movement to penetrate churches that have not yet succumbed to ecumenism next page page 22 we venture to express two hopes for the emerging dialogue firstly and this is the critical one we hope and pray that the charismatic renewal will not be too hastily classified labeled and thus isolated John, when this whole thing was getting started of the celebration movement with its Pentecostal dimensions in our church, do you remember what the leadership said? Let's wait and see. Oh, that's what they said. Let's not classify it. Let's not classify it. This has been their pat cliche from the very beginning. Let's just wait and see. Wait and see. It fits exactly. It's as if they were reading right out of the If it's of God, it'll prosper. But if it's not, well, we don't have to worry about it. God will take care of it. Let's just wait and see. And this has been what every one of our church leadership have said about the celebration movement. Let's just wait and see. Does that have anything to do with the strategy plan of, of Catholicism? Well, that's it. It's, it's, a, it's like those statements were right out of the script here. It's exactly right what, out of the script. what the World Council of Churches said should not be done. Let's not classify it too Wait closely. Let's not isolate it. Let's not label it. Now, next page. Divisions are not His, that is the Holy Spirit's doing, but due to human sin. Uh, what did Christ say? I came not to bring peace, but a sword. sword. A man shall be divided against the members of Matthew his own 10. household. Amen. Well, at any rate, 
uh, that tells us a little bit in the mid 80s what was brewing behind the scenes. We didn't yet have the full impact of celebration at that time, but it was being the plans were developing in the ecumenical movement. 19 Hey, I, I want to make sure that our people understand what you're endeavoring to do here, from what I can see. Started in the 70s or Started 60s, 60s, 50s, 50s. 50s. <laughs> theologically, you know, the theological base of the new theology is Roman Catholicism, yeah. original sin, yeah. and the pre-fall nature of Christ. That's Roman Catholic doctrine. Okay, if you... you Salvation know, in sin is Roman Catholic doctrine. You say, okay, first we said 70s, you said 60s, you said 50s. Uh, 40s, 1946 is when is when the the nature of Christ was taken out of uh, Bible readings for the home circle. When that disappeared about Him coming in our fallen nature, the 1946 edition of uh, Bible readings for the home circle. Mm -hmm. Then the Barnhouse and Martin Eternity magazine things in the 50s and uh, questions on doctrines. Uh, so the church has been shifted over to a new theological base. But, but we can go back to the 30s and, and, the, and the 20s where we first adopted uh, a, a, a accreditation for our colleges, you know, so how, we can just keep going 1909, back. 1909, a Jesuit professor was kicked out of Mount Vernon College. You know, we can just keep going back, but, but, let's go forward now, we're, okay. you have got us up to now, to mid, the 1980s. Mid-1980s, okay. 1985, at the November 1985 meeting of the Society for Pentecostal Studies, Dr. Vincent Sinan outlined the coordination of Pentecostals with their Roman Catholic counterparts. At the meeting, the Roman Catholic priest Peter Hawken was named president of the Society for Pentecostal Studies. So now they're laying a battle plan, a blueprint, a coordination. That's all documented in this book, The Pied Piper of the Pentecostal Movement, The Spiritual Power of the New World Order. Who printed that? This is a Bible Baptist minister who printed this. You see, people from the outside, people outside the Seventh-day Adventist Church realize what is going on? This is why in my very first celebration video, and I showed articles from, from eternity, I mean, from uh, Christianity Today, and these outside uh, quotes from um, uh, the, the Salvation Army magazine, and, and these other Christian churches that are seeing what's going on in the Adventist church, and the Pied Piper, that's exactly what's going on. They're just, our people following are just following our leadership, having no idea what is going on. And, and Christians on the outs in these other churches outside of the Seventh-day Adventist church are looking and saying, look what's going on in, in Adventism. And our people, it's the Pied Piper following our leadership. We have no idea. And when I show our Adventist people, what other churches realize and what we are so blind to because of our blind faith and trust in our leadership, our people are just amazed and shocked that all this stuff has been going on and we never knew about it. 1986, John, the Shepherding Cell Group movement moves into the mainstream of the charismatic movement. Now, in the mid-1970s, Pat Robertson condemned the Shepherding Cell Group movement. Incidentally, let me get another book here, John because the roots of this are very I'm start taking some of these off. very significant. Don't take any that are yeah, take the ones that we've already <laughs> dealt with. John. They'll be on the floor if you need them. <laughs> okay. Bob, you got to have some room here before they all start falling off and we have a big big mighty crash here. They'll all be here if if, okay. if you need them, okay? Where did the cell group come from? Now, this is uh, this is one of the the definitive work on brainwashing by Robert J. Lifton, prominent scholar Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, a study of brainwashing in now, what China. Is, what is totalism? Totalitarianism. I see. So it, the where you totally take control. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like communism. Sure. You see. And in this book, he talks of how cell groups were used in the communist Chinese revolution and how the cell groups were so effective in dealing with the Westerners that they captured. From cell to celebration. Is it, does this tie in with that? Well, let me give you a little history of the cell group, John. <laughs> Absolutely, could, it ties oh, in. Wow. Sure. Now, now, it was very effective, you see, in changing the thinking of dissidents, cell groups. No, wait, out. I, I, I am, you know, I want to make sure we just, you just don't slip through this stuff. <laughs> changing the thinking oh, of dissidents. Absolutely. That is exactly what our periodicals are trying to do today. This is exactly what the Perth Declaration sure. is doing. This is exactly what our leadership propaganda is trying to do. Propaganda warfare against the historic Adventist in the Seventh Adventist Church trying to twist 
get them around to their way of thinking. That's the whole purpose of NLP. That is the reason that the Seventh Avenue Church, more than any other denomination on earth, has embraced neurolinguistic programming is because there are all these, quote, dissidents in the Seventh Avenue Church and the leadership has to somehow deal with them and get them over to their way of thinking. So how do you do that? You look at history. NLP, you hypnotize them. Not only that, but the small group. The cell, the cell group. Absolutely. Cell group. And it ties right in with the hypnotic process of changing a whole uh, a, a set group of people's thinking. This is considered evidence. to be one of the most profound books on this subject. And there are case examples in here of how cell groups were used in brainwashing. Now, what's interesting, John, is that the shepherding cell group movement was adopted by Paul Yonggi Cho, Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho. Incidentally, Paul... Is he the pa pastor of the largest church in the world? The largest church. That's he took it, his 50, church... 50,000, South Korea. From 500,000. What? Half a million. I thought it was 50,000. A half a million. He's got a church of A few years ago, it was a quarter of a million. 500,000. That's why. Don't you want a 500,000 member church, John? I don't know how they'd all They're... fit in here. But... <laughs> I mean, we're packed now. <laughs> Look here. The third, the third uh, item in the bibliography, Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho, successful home cell groups. So over in South Korea, he adopted the cell group concept and built his church up from 600 to a half a million. Uh, and it, of course, captured the attention of the charismatic churches around the world. And he is one of the most prominent speakers and promoters of this. Now, when this movement came into America, it had many abuses. It was a very totalitarian type of, uh, of uh, dynamic operating in these small groups. They'd have a leader, an assistant leader. They were requiring people to produce their checkbooks to show where they were paying their tithe. I've heard of that. Now, this is exactly what we John, see going on. When, when I go around, uh, when I go speaking, John, I had a I had a group from a church come up to me and they said, uh, "We have a celebration church. We have cell groups in our church, and in our cell groups, every person is to expose what's in their inner heart. We are each one to write that down and turn in the report to the pastor." You see, NLP and small cell groups are being used also as the Adventist confessional. I had a woman call me up. She said, I just had a divorce. My husband married another woman. The pastor took me in for counseling. He's had the labs. And Lab I, told him, I told him all kinds of things that I, I felt I shouldn't have afterward. He asked me to even write this stuff out. I wrote it out. I turned it into him. I was apprehensive. I asked for it back. He said he had thrown it away. Uh, there are, there's case after case of this that that uh, is coming to our attention. And in the Roman Catholic Church on Saturday afternoons now, they have reconciliation services. If a person doesn't like the old style confessional, they can go to reconciliation services. They all sit in a circle, like a sensitivity group or a, or a small group, and everyone confesses to everyone else. This is, reminds me of what uh, so many of our Seventh Avenue churches have now, is they have a traditional service, and they also have a celebration service. So the churches have, whatever way you like it, uh, that's the way they have it. So they have, have two, they have two services, a traditional service for the, tr for the traditionalist mm -hmm. and a celebration service for the celebrationist. And uh, you can have it any way that you like it. And one of the concepts, of course, in the celebration is everything that we've studied thus far, but is this thing that takes the place of the Catholic confessional. Yes. Oh, and why the confessional? That is the most powerful information gathering tool the Roman Catholic Church has had for centuries. Why do we want an ambassador at the Vatican? Because they have the best intelligence gathering network in the world. And the confessional historically has been used to gain information and thus control over nations, over individuals. You find out what's going on in their inner heart. But you see, because of these abuses, Pat Robertson spoke out against it in the early days. But then in, by the mid-1980s, 1986, suddenly Pat Robertson welcomes them with open arms. They all make up. And the cell group movement moves into center stage in the charismatic movement. And it forms the basic unit and tool in the promulgation of celebration churches. Now, now. Uh, New theology pastors have been using this for years in America. 
I can think of one right now that came over from Australia. And Cell Group was the basis of his celebration church. The Coalition on Revival, COR, which is pushing for a totalitarian Christian America. That's a fundamentalist, charismatic movement that crosses all kinds of boundaries. It's a powerful behind-the-scenes element in politics. It is pushing for a Christian America in which uh, every person's conscience will be subject to the person above them. They call for all pastors to restructure their congregations into home cell groups. Home cell groups. Have, it's have a, you heard that term any place? It's, it's a revolutionary <laughs> technique, John. It's a revolutionary technique. Oh, Bob. In fact, the Reconstructionists who are high in the levels of the it's... Coalition on Revival say that uh, one, uh, uh, Gary North, who is the second in command in Reconstructionism, says that Rush Dooney, who's the top man, is the Marx, and I'm trying to be the Engels of this movement. They're obvious revolutionaries. And we just think that this home cell group concept that is advertised by the Oregon Conference and all of our periodicals, and they're now going around all over the country promoting this and teaching it to all the pastors and to all the conferences, is just a wonderful new method of evangelism for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it came not only out of Catholicism, but has come out of strategy for thousands of years to brainwash people. Communist Chinese movement, basis in modern times. And now we come down also in 1986, uh, Wilson Ewan, the author of this book, he's a pastor, he warns the developing story of ecumenical unity continues at a staggering pace. And when the Vatican's dream of a corporate and global religious complex with the Pope as head is shortly realized, Pentecostalism will stand accused before a holy God of being the chief instrument in having brought this to pass. Pentecostalism is the thread that runs through all of this endeavoring of the Roman Catholic to bring the churches back. It's the back chief to, tool to bring the all the churches tool. and to create the New World Order. It's the spiritual power of the New World One Order. One of the two things that we are seeing being manifested recently in the Seventh Avenue Church just in the last several years, Pentecostalism and Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Everywhere we turn in the Seventh Avenue Church, we are seeing either Catholicism right. or Pentecostalism. Right. You know, through the music, through the artwork, mm -hmm. through our periodicals, through the stuff coming from our church, the two main thrust and those are the two things that have joined hands is Catholicism, Catholicism and, and Pentecostalism which is and apostate Protestant and apostate Protestant which is which is which is the three unclean spirits like fog that's right I mean it's prophecy before our eyes right. why are our people so blind why can't we see this stuff Bob well my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge John it's so clear as I'm sitting here talking it's, to you. It's, it's so clear what's going on right. in our church. That's right. That this is an orchestrated attempt. Now, I am not and neither are you saying that, our, that all of our leadership understand what's That's going right. on. But it only takes even one person in a movement yes. to, to channel them all in the, that That's direction. That's right. But they are being, they are being guided by a, by a strategy, by a script that many of them don't even know that they're following. But you see, on the basis... They've been prepared On for. the basis of submission to one superior and to the church as being the final authority, they fit right into the plan. Right into the place. They don't even. All you have to do is bring in this concept. And incidentally, John, this is a Jesuit concept. Let me get a book for you. You just keep bringing the books over, though, and you just keep bringing us through through time. Now we're in the late eighties now. Of this yeah, nineteen eighty-six. Okay, the and strategy. In the spiritual exercise of Saint Ignatius, John, we have a section entitled "The Rules for Thinking with the Church." And here is what we read. In order to have the proper attitude of mind in the church militant, we should observe the following rules. Number one, putting aside all private judgment, we should keep our minds prepared and ready to obey promptly, and in all things, the true spouse of Christ our Lord, our Holy Mother, the hierarchical church. Is that part of the Jesuit oath that you are totally dead and you just do whatever uh, you are told to do by the church? Exactly. Uh, it's, the, it's not only part of the Jesuit oath, but it is involved in the training of the spiritual exercise. That's what this is. This is the manual which the initiates into the Jesuit order go through for four weeks, for 30 days, 
They are led through these spiritual exercises, which now have been introduced into our ministry yes. and are being used in our churches now for the purpose of creating a mentality of what is called by them cadaver obedience. Cadaver obedience. Yes. That's part of the Jesuit oath. That's it. Now, here's number 13. If we wish to be sure that we are right in all things, we should always be ready to accept this principle. I will believe that the white that I see is black if the hierarchical church so defines it. For I believe that between the bridegroom Christ our Lord and the bride his church, there is but one spirit which governs and directs us for the salvation of our souls, for the same spirit and Lord who gave us the Ten Commandments guides and governs our Holy Mother Church. So you see there's the concept of automatic identity between Christ and the church. Therefore, you have to be prepared to believe that the white that you see is black if the church says that white is black. The church is going through. She's the object of God's supreme regard. She's going th and the conference is the church. Therefore, stay with the conference. Do what we say and you'll be saved. It's this cadaver mentality that our Adventist people have that the conference is the church. Therefore, you stay with the conference and you're going to heaven. God help us. It's right out of the Jesuit plan of giving total mind control, uh, total, 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 totalitarianism right. to, the, to the church. That's right. And the spiritual exercises are used to accomplish that purpose. I believe that's probably it's why we're... It's the brainwashing of the that's Adventist right. people. That's right. In fact, not only the Adventist people, but historically, Heinrich Himmler used the spiritual exercises to form the Nazi SS, one million men. He had a special work for them to do, and part of it was running death camps. You, you gave a whole issue, or maybe even more, of your freedom's ring to how this all worked in Nazi Germany. That's right. You want to just touch on that? Did, sure. Uh, how was all this used with Nazi Germany and with Hitler, and what did Catholicism have to do with that, and how does that tie in with present-day Adventism? Can, can we hit that chronologically? Sure. We're almost to it, John. <laughs> you know, I'm just thinking of all of these things. And I don't okay. want to leave anything out. But I don't want to leave anything order. out. That's why I'm trying. Okay. You, you keep saying those things, and I'll keep trying okay. to move us I'm chronologically. I'm going to write it down here. Okay. Now, I want to uh, give you another statement, John, from this uh, pastor who wrote this book, The Pied Piper of the Pentecostal Movement. For 12 centuries, Papal Rome has planned and worked to impose church rule over mankind. Pressure has come through navies, armies, including the Nazi regime, torture, and the stake. All have failed. Then in 1963, Pope John XXIII put in motion a Vatican II Council device for world religious unity. It was a vital step in a final thrust for success, the strategy of ecumenism. And the Holy See awaits with open arms and complete satisfaction as the Pentecostal movement hastens that impending hour of disastrous triumph and vicious control. And so now we are in the late 1980s. The celebration movement is taking hundreds of SDA churches by storm with the speed of lightning. And then in 1989, the spiritual exercises of the Jesuit order are introduced into the SDA ministry and congregations. And they spread across the land. They're being taught from the West Coast to the East Coast, Canada, Andrews. Uh, it's called cataphatic prayer imaging. It's a modern term for it. John, and it's catching on hundreds and thousands of miles. I want to bring you some more books here, Get John, some more books. on this subject that you just <laughs> asked me about. And that is the, uh, the connection there with Nazi Germany. Other things. Oh, by the way, you know that um, in gathering brochure I was telling you about? Yes. Terry Ross just handed it to me, yes. and maybe we should, uh, l you know, I'll, I'll show it on screen as we were talking uh, about it there, but it's just amazing how these three wavy lines go right through it. And it even has one here of the fellow worshiping the sun with yep. the three wavy lines and it going into one. Our people should be looking at this new uh, in-gathering brochure. It ties right in with what you're saying here. Okay, our authorized Bible vindicated. I'm going to lay it by Wilkinson. I'm laying that down here. And if you need any of this, just holler and I'll get it for you. Well, we've only got okay. so much room on this little table. Okay. Okay. okay, what are you going to show, show us now? All right, John, uh, we want to look now a little more closely at the spiritual exercises because they're coming into our church now. I listened to the tape uh, by Bill Lovelace one last summer. Yes, the one you had on yeah, your tape. Yeah, my first. 
and, and as I listened to it, I had the earphones on, and I had this book, The Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius, in my lap, and I was thumbing from one page to the next following along as he was leading them in the spiritual exercises. So in our July issue of Freedom's Ring, we laid it out one half of a page against the other half. On one side, the spiritual exercises quotes. On the other side, Bill Loveless's uh, quotes in that workers' meeting where he led the workers in the spiritual exercises. Pastors. Pastors. Uh, and what is behind the spiritual exercises? Well, Ignatius Loyola developed these exercises to combat the Protestant Reformation. And in Munich, in Bavaria, the, in the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuits moved into that area, and they held that area against the Protestant Reformation. They taught the spiritual exercises to the common people. Incidentally, the Roman Catholic Church is trying to accomplish that very thing today. As I was going in to uh, take care of my father when he was passing away from cancer, uh, he was in the hospital, and I turned on the radio 3 o'clock in the morning, and an NPR station was carrying a BBC broadcast by a Roman Catholic like priest advocating the spiritual exercises for the common man. And that's what we are being Uncon taught. Unconditional that's what love. That's we are being taught in exactly. the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes. Now, what happens in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius? It is mysticism, first of all, St. Ignatius's profound precepts of mystical theology. It is, a, it is a form of mysticism which brings together the mystical approach of Catholicism in the medieval times, along with Ignatius's own discoveries. He wrote a journal, journal entries, which we're seeing everywhere all of a sudden. It's in becoming a master student. It's being utilized by Bill yeah, Lovelace. Writing and the a pastors. journal. Everyone's I, writing a journal. Wow, yes, we had that that, in, it's called yeah. for here in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius. But basically what happens, the man entering the Jesuit order goes through this 30-day program in which his, he learns to surrender his conscience to his superior. Now, this very thing is happening within our own church, and I know the story of a, of a historic Adventist church school teacher who stood up in behalf of the truth and ran into opposition from the conference office, and the conference president told him that if you're having trouble accepting my position on this, then you're going to have to surrender your conscience and accept my conscience. That's exactly what the spiritual exercises are designed to do. And the avenue by which they accomplish that is they use the imagination to control the will. Yes. Now, Ellen White says that a surrendered will is to control the imagination. Yes. So you see, they've turned that around sure. backwards. Sure. And so to control the will, they use the imagination to uh, imagine that. that you are by the sea. Imagine, right. paint the color of the sky in. Imagine that you see Jesus. Imagine, you know, what is he wearing? What are you wearing? Where are you? Imagine yourself, you know, we went through all of that with this Bill Loveless thing. And that's what's being taught. It's even being taught to our youth now in the December 30, 1992 devotional. Oh, you, okay. Bring that up. Let's show the people right now. Now, I want to tell you something, that this is what uh, we have had so many phone calls from college students in our colleges, and they say this stuff is being taught all over the place in our youth departments, in our periodicals, not just Bill Loveless and a one-time incident with our ministers. This is, going, this is going through our church like wildfire, just as Celebration did. All of these concepts that came out of Catholicism that you're showing to us to today. Right. Now... At the Nuremberg trials, Walter Schellenberg, and this is quoted in The Nazis and the Occult, Walter Schellenberg told of how Heinrich Himmler, who was in charge of the Nazi SS, had the best library in all of Europe on the Jesuits. He had an uncle who was a Jesuit, and he would spend hours every evening perusing in that library and he built the whole Nazi SS up based on the spiritual exercises. He wanted men who had no conscientious scruples personally that would block them from obeying orders. And so he, uh, he accomplished the cadaver obedience he was after by inculcating them in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Is it not only possible but probable that the reason celebration NLP, all of these techniques are being used on our people and been brought into the Seventh Adventist Church is to give Adventist people a cadaver obedience to the conference 
Absolutely. Not only the Congress, but to the papacy, ultimately. Ultimately to the papacy. Ultimately to the papacy, and ultimately to the devil himself. To where they will one day receive the mark of the beast. Conscience is silenced. Bottom line. Not only that, but they can also become the worst persecutors, because look at what the Nazi SS did. Isn't that what our prophet tells us? That's how they do that. That's how our former Adventists become our worst persecutors, is because they have succumbed to this type of thing. And, John, in, the, in Heinrich Himmler's experience, he not only used Western mystical, quote, Christian or papal mysticism, Vatican-type mysticism, but he also was into Eastern mysticism. He told his doctor that he never made a move without the Bhagavad Gita. So he what was that. De Bhagavad Gita is the uh, Hindu Bible. Ah, okay. And they like to say that it's older than our mm. Christian Bible. At any rate, he was deeply. He read the Rig Vedas. He 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 read all of this Eastern. Uh, writings, the Eastern writings, was into Eastern mysticism as well as Western mysticism. And Bill Lovelace basically is a blend of the two. Now, Bill Lovelace at the beginning of his talk mentioned Morton Kelsey, that yes. Ellen White's writing was just like that of Morton right. Kelsey, as you recall. And here's Morton Kelsey's book, Companions on the Inner Way. I'd like to just bring you a couple of, of uh, statements from this book. Some of Kelsey's thought. This point of view gave rise to a rich and lively devotional practice which animated the early church and continued through medieval times. There are a few more magnificent spiritual writings than those of Bernard of Clairvaux, Mother, Mother Julian, a number of others here. It is just these magnificent writings that Paulus Press is bringing back into publication. The actual religious practice of the Middle Ages as it took place within the monastic communities was gathered together and systematized in classic form by Ignatius of Loyola in his spiritual exercises. So you see what Bill Lovelace says is the, you know, we're not getting into Eastern mysticism here, we're into Western mysticism <laughs> you see and that's a spiritual exercise right. but actually it's a blend of the two as you listen to it this is what is known as the cataphatic tradition of prayer prayer that uses images in devotional practice to mediate the divine now incidentally this practice of creating your own image of Christ in your imagination explain cataphatic is Cataphatic is the term that's used for the spiritual exercises. Okay, that's the term. That, that's a modern term for, that, for putting across okay. the spiritual exercises. The idea that you can create the divine, create the creator, is very much like the Eucharist, yes. you see. Create the creature the creator. creates the creator. Yes. This is also divination. You divine, you divine, you conjure up your God, you see. And then you make your God do what you oh, want. Oh, and that's exactly what Bill Lovelace did with those pastors. You make he your conjured God, up Jesus. Yeah, you, you conjure up your God. You have him come through the door. You have him sit down in the chair you want him to sit. You say the things, and he says the things. Oh, it reminds me of the spiritualist medium, the witch of Endor. They it, conjure, it is, how they conjure up. It, it's witchcraft. It, it's, it's, it's witchcraft. Exactly. That's what it is. Uh, here's another statement from Morton Kelsey. The spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola gathered up and systematized with genius the religious practices that have been normative for several centuries in Christian devotional practice. So he is a big promoter of the spiritual exercises, you see. And now, that's, the, that's the one that Bill Lovelace compared to Ellen White. Right. Now, the other one that he compared her to, he compared her to Buddhist writings, but he also compared her to William, William Johnston. Johnston. That's right. I've, I've right. Sophia, Sophia University Sophia in Tokyo. Sophia University in Tokyo. All right. Now, here I have the cloud of unknowing with an introduction by William Johnston. This is the same William Johnston, the Jesuit. He is a Jesuit professor at Sophia University in Tokyo. Now, in order, for, in, in order for William Lovelace to know about these men, he has to be reading their books. He has to be reading their works. That's very, how can you, very how can you read and absorb all this stuff without becoming influenced by it? This is what worries me about you. You're doing all this research, and, and I'm just praying, and I know that you have too, that God will, pr will protect you in your research from being in the slightest bit uh, uh, caught up or... or you know, I'm really praying for you as you delve into all this stuff, Bob, that God will protect you from being, being caught up in I'll it. I'll tell you the worst thing. The worst thing that I ever had to research was NLP. 
That is the most evil thing that I have ever seen. John, I prayed continually. I had to break away. I had to take prayer walks. It was the most evil thing that I have ever seen. I just talked to Constance Cumbie on the phone. I've, she, her and I talk a lot, and she, she called me just this past week. And in fact, um, we're, we're thinking about having Constance Cumbie come down for a, a um, uh, interview on video here in just a, cup, a couple of weeks. But in her book, uh, Hidden Secrets, Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, um, she talks about the way that New Age is coming to the Christian church. Mm -hmm. And when I told her how that we were doing this research on neurolinguistic programming, she says, oh, neurolinguistic NLP, she says, that is just evil. She says, that is one of the most evil of all the, th the New Age techniques that's coming to the mm -hmm. Seventh-day Ad Adventist church. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you realize how, how evil and, and I'm going to be interviewing Terry Ross in just a few moments here at the end of my interview with you. I'm going to, Terry Ross has found some startling things, uh, new things about the evilness of, N, of NLP. And to realize that we are, the, we are the church that is foremost. The Seventh Day Adventist Church is the most uh, foremost promoter of NLP of all the other church denominations. Seventh Day Adventist promotes NLP more than any other church. John Savage is... Of the 40 churches he is working with, the first and foremost one is Seventh-day Adventism. And, and even non-Adventists are, are telling us that it is the most evil of all the New Age techniques that has crept into the Christian right. church. Uh, listen to this from the Great Controversy. None are in greater danger from the influence of evil spirits than those who, notwithstanding the direct and ample testimony of the scriptures, deny the existence and agency of the devil and his angels. So long as we are ignorant of their wiles, they have almost inconceivable advantage. Many give heed to their suggestions while they suppose themselves to be following the dictates of their own wisdom. There is nothing that the great deceiver fears so much as that we shall become acquainted with his devices. So my purpose in studying this, of course, is to reveal Satan's devices. Amen. Because without that, people are walking into it not knowing what it is. Well, we are going to ask God to continue to, to protect you as you do this research. Now, you've brought us up to in time frame up to the late 80s and we're into the well, 90s yet? Well, y yes, we're, we're right on the brink of the 90s now with the coming in of the uh, spiritual exercises. And William, I wanted to say something else about William Johnston. He's a Teal Hardian Jesuit. Now, yeah, the, explain that. the most influential figure in the New Age movement is Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a Jesuit. Yes, sir. He's a renegade Jesuit. But he is the one who believes that when the consciousness of humanity is completely united and uh, all of humanity's consciousness level is, is heightened to a certain point, then the Omega Christ will appear. The Omega Christ? The Omega Christ. Yes, now this is very uh, interesting that he, who is a Jesuit, has had great influence among Roman Catholic theologians and the Jesuit order with his ideas about the Omega Christ. And he believes that this will be the real incarnation of the Christ. So we're talking about Satan personating the exactly. Christ. Exactly. As the Omega Christ. And that's only the beginning and of it, And of course John. we know about the Omega apostasy in the Seventh-day right. Adventist Church, a most startling nature. Right. Ooh, boy. John, this book here, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ by Matthew Fox, is absolutely startling. Now, this man is a Dominican scholar. The Dominicans ran the Inquisition, incidentally. Yeah. Both of these men are renegades, I will say that. But in this book of The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, he describes how there has to be worldwide liturgical change liturgical. in celebration. Yes. Celebration is a fundamental, style. fundamental thing all the way through. But he gets deeply into mysticism. And he says we have to have deep mysticism in order to have deep ecumenism. And he, I was reading along in here, and he got to the point where he was telling about the uh, primary example of deep mysticism taking place. And he cites uh, an experience that took place just recently in North Carolina, a summer workshop on creation spirituality. Now, the cosmic Christ, incidentally, is a pantheistic Christ. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin said that the cosmic Christ is neither human nor divine. 
he is cosmic. He well, is that's in what everything. we saw in the coming, uh, coming of the cosmic king exactly. in the ministry magazine that we... Uh, that, that painting parallels what you read in here. And in this deepest example of deep mysticism, bringing about deep ecumenical realignment, there were at this creation spirituality workshop in North Carolina, not only Roman Catholics and Quakers, Anglicans and Methodists, but Southern Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists. And it says right there in that book. Yes, I was just reading it along. You see, this is the thing that our leadership denies and lies to our people and telling them we have nothing to do with this stuff. And then we read about it. But you see, our people are not reading this book. These books, praise the Lord. But, but also, praise the Lord for researchers such as yourself, that the Lord takes you to and shows you what is really going on in the Seventh-day Adventist Church so that you can warn our people that we're being lied to. You see, the, the uh, cosmic Christ... Being a pantheistic Christ is identical. It's the idea of divinity being in everything. And it is identical to the, the Baal worship that was present in the days of Elijah, where they believed that the Baals lived in the trees, in the stones, in, 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 in uh, this and that. And also the pantheistic element of it parallels precisely the alpha of apostasy. So we've come right down to the... Um, to the omega of apostasy there and for the tie-in uh, John between New Age and Roman Catholicism that goes beyond even Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and Matthew Fox a Dominican scholar I have this book here Mary in Faith and Life in the New Age of the Church Mary in Faith and Life in the New Age look at that term New Age New of Age the of the Church and did you know that over at Mujigori in Europe Mary, the apparition of Mary that is appearing to the children, is she is telling the children that Mary is very upset with the world because they are not keeping Sunday. Ah, not keep Mary is upset because we're not keeping Sunday. What about does that tie in with this thing in Fatima? Well, Fatima is a similar type of thing. Fatima was more dealing with the conversion of Russia. And here, and here we have the Virgin Mary being promoted in our own, I mean, you know, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised, Proverbs 31, 30. They use this as a passage in this, in this Andrews uh, uh, Theological Seminary and our Andrews University uh, casting yearbook with a picture of Mary to promote the Virgin Mary. I mean, this is unbelievable. Have, have you noticed, Bob, how suddenly on, on the whole world, not just on Catholics, but on the whole world, on the Protestant world, everybody's talking about Mary? Mm -hmm. I've noticed that just recently, that suddenly everybody's talking about the Virgin Mary. That's right. So we have the spiritual exercises that uh, have been brought in to, to basically subjugate uh, the people to the clergy in a hierarchical fashion like the Jesuit order has. And then in by 1991, we have hundreds. You've released some lists of this, John. Hundreds of SDA pastors that have been trained in the most sophisticated hypnotic techniques in existence to fasten the congregations in apostasy. Um, when you look historically at the principles used in NLP, it's very significant to me that in the Cheka in Russia, the precursor of the modern KGB, they used pacing. Zerzinski, who had been trained in a seminary, he was a uh, Polish Catholic, he was used by uh, Lenin to set up the counter-espionage service of the Cheka, and uh, he said, we give a man whatever he wants. We, uh, learn, we teach them how to uh, want to be deceived. Mm -hmm. And this is so fundamental to Our NLP. people want to be deceived. Our Seventh-day Adventist people want to believe that the conference is the church and that all you have to do is stay with the conference and blind loyalty to the conference and you're going to stay with the ship and go to heaven. Our people want to be deceived. Our people want to believe that the conference is the church, that our leadership is not corrupt, that we're not being led by uh, uh, Catholicism and Pentecostalism and uh, New Age techniques. You know, they... 
and they want to believe that that the conference is the church and all they have to do is trust the conference and they're going to heaven so you know that just fits right into where we are as a people our people want to be deceived yes in fact Ellen White says in Great Controversy that that Satan has a deception for anyone who's unwilling to lift the cross and go against the grain of the carnal heart in their spiritual following of Christ oh. so we've uh, this is uh, an utter abomination, as you've pointed out, John. The, the NLP uh, business is uh, for binding the congregations into this very thing that Ellen White warned against in Great Controversy. We're, we're seeing it happen before our very eyes. And now we come to 1991, and we have John Paul II in the encyclical in May, uh, Centesimus Annus, calling for national Sunday laws around the world for all the nations to order their legal system to accommodate uh, Sunday laws. And President Bush is working, laboring to construct a new world order based on international law through the United Nations. We have communism collapsing in Russia. The major deterrent to the military might of of America has vaporized and now we are even sending funds over peace, for the demolition peace. of their nuclear yes, arms peace, and America peace. is emerging center stage as the dominant force in the United Nations and we taught a lesson to the world in Kuwait you don't mess with the United Nations led by the United States yeah. or we'll bomb you into the Stone Age That's right. and and so the stage is all set John it's being set in we haven't even touched on it in the in the courts uh, constitutionally in the law schools the whole way is prepared for the final crisis being right what's right going on us. in Europe tie in with this absolutely give us a little give us a little uh, idea of how the organization of the European states is developing Sunday laws I was amazed to find this out from David Mole David Mole is all about it Sabbath uh, bless his heart the research that he is doing right. and how that the unification of Europe uh, the European states has already mandated a Sunday law mm -hmm. and they're enforcing it and the people do not want it the individual countries do not want it but the but the organization of European states says it must be and it is law John I had an individual send me some clippings from uh, European papers indicating that some of the northern European nations in Scandinavia are very clear uh, some of the newspaper editorials and pa uh, articles were very clear that the papacy is behind this, and they fear falling into this. Even they thing. see it. Yeah. Bless their heart. Yeah. Now, Bob, we're in 1991. Uh, wrap us up here and and tell us how we, as historic Adventist people, can keep from being sucked into this whole thing. Well, John, you know the Bible says over and over again, "Unto him shall the gathering of the people be." We need to gather around Christ and Christ in his word and have a deep deep experience John we've got to have an experience that is deeper and broader than Enoch's and Elijah's because the subtlety of the deceptions we face is so much greater and the 144,000 will sing a song that no other group sings because they've gone through an experience Amen. that no other church uh, no other group of people has gone through and so we have to understand true Protestantism and thank God for the book, Great Controversy. Amen. For the Bible. We have to spend time. This has to be the chief pursuit of our Amen. life. Amen. Knowing God, knowing the principles of true Protestantism, knowing the principles of the Word, being faithful in our own personal life, and exhibiting and experiencing in our own heart the righteousness of Christ received by faith. Bob, you have made comment on several occasions today that you feel so bad because you left this book and you left that book and you left all these books. And I mean, you were going to talk about modern warfare and you said, oh, I left all those books out, how the, 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 the techniques of, of modern warfare have just come right out of, uh, uh, help me out here. Well, Marx and Engels, from then on, they have seen that, uh, that diplomatic warfare comes first. You seek to win your enemy over through diplomacy, and Rome used that with Martin Luther. They tried to do that. Ideological warfare, propaganda warfare, economic warfare, and only use military force as a last resort. So what many of our people are, I think, uh, of the mindset of is that suddenly this national Sunday law will appear 
and there will be teeth in it. But Ellen White says the first one will be just a touch. Yeah. But they think there will be this national Puppy Sunday dog. law with, with teeth in it, and then they'll suddenly wake up and they'll realize that oh. they're in the last days. But what they don't Doesn't realize is we're, we're in That's the right. heavy onslaught right. of the conditioning process yes. conditioning of Rome. Conditioning process. Conditioning process. We are being conditioned, conditioned. for the Sunday blue laws. See, be not, be, law. not, be not shaped into the mold of this world, but be ye transformed. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind in Christ Jesus. If we're not continually every day and every hour being transformed by the renewing power of Christ, we will inevitably can be conditioned and be swept right into the mark of the beast. Well, Bob, I appreciate so much this information that you have brought us and what a debt of gratitude our Adventist people have to you for enlightening us to what is really taking place in our beloved Seventh Adventist Church and this wonderful message that we have. I still have an interview of Terry Ross I've got to take. He's found out some startling information about NLP and an update from him on what's going on in the, the Shady Point Church there in Oregon. But before we leave, I look over to that table and I see all those books that we haven't even touched on. We may have to have you back again here at Prophecy County. And it's been most enjoyable Has and it was such me, a John. blessing the rolling hills church members on sabbath said how much they appreciated your sermon and talk on sabbath afternoon and the question and answer period that we had before we get out of this interview i just want to ask you to lead us in prayer and to pray for god's people in these trying hours Amen. of earth's history Amen. kneel with me bob and lead us in prayer mm. gracious father in heaven it's been wonderful to fellowship together today and Lord our great prayer our great cry to thee from our heart is for a mighty revival of primitive godliness Lord the Holy Spirit is moving across the face of the earth looking for hearts that will be open to his leading may our hearts be open may the mighty power of Christ take control transforming all of life help us to have your world view that is given in the book of Revelation yes, and Daniel and the great controversy. Help us to be faithful, to spend time with thee in our prayer lives, Amen. to study diligently and to walk in the light. Give us great courage. Give us faith. Help us to learn how to use the armory of heaven, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, feet shod with the gospel of peace and girt about with truth. Give us the knowledge, the understanding, the ability, and the willpower, and thy righteousness, thy love, thy spirit Amen. in these closing hours that we will be sealed with the seal of the living God, that we will be faithful even unto death, and that we will receive a crown of life from thy hand and sing that song in heaven and dwell with thee throughout the ceaseless Amen. ages of eternity. Bless John here in his ministry, and bless each one of thy faithful ones around the world. Bless our church, we pray, Amen. and help us each one to be ready for the issues, to be ready for thy soon coming is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless your heart, Bob, my brother in Christ. God be with you. Come God back to you, see Tom. us here at Prophecy County. It's been wonderful to be Thank here. Thank you. Terry Ross, what a privilege it has been to have you and Kathy here at Prophecy Countdown. How long have you been here now? Two months. Two months. It's gone great. I got so tickled with the letter we just got from uh, uh, a little friend of yours. where he right. wrote, We read it, <laughs> he read it in church seven, and his big question was, how are you and John getting along? <laughs> I think a lot of people have been worried about that. They think it's like putting nitro and glycerin together, you know, putting Terry Ross and John Osborne together. Well, if it's controlled, it's powerful. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. It has been such a thrill to have you all here. What a godsend you have been to this ministry. And I appreciate the research that you have done. And that's what I want to talk to you about right now. You have found something in Mother Jones magazine. I'll have to admit to you, I've never ever, ever heard of that magazine. But you found a most astounding article, and I want you to share it with uh, our Prophecy Countdown supporters right right now. I'll be glad to. Uh, earlier, I think you mentioned uh, Constance Cumby. Yes. She's a famous attorney and also right. an author, uh, as you have pointed out. And she sent us a fax a few days ago, and on that fax was an article from um, a little known, I suspect, magazine called Mother Jones. I didn't know about it either, but Mother Jones magazine is a, politica, a political active magazine. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, speaks out on many, many issues. And inside the issue of uh, February, March 1989, and I know we'll show this to the people, uh, there's an article in there that I would like to share uh, with our people that I think holds just powerful weight to the things that we've been trying to expose in the NLP area. Show us. Now, I'm purposely not going to say who this is, but uh, we'll just uh, tell the story and, and pick up on who it is later, okay? I mean, who the story is who, ab about. Is, is about, that's okay. right. We have to go back uh, to New Jersey uh, of 1950, and this uh, man uh, that we're talking about was born in New Jersey. In his school days, he, by the time he got into high school, he'd moved out to Sunnyvale, California. That's my old stomping ground, John. I was born in San Jose and raised in Sacramento and actually worked in Sunnyvale for a time. Uh, that's known now uh, to most people as the Silicon Valley. Uh, this uh, young man had a real restless childhood. He didn't make friends easily and he had a language uh, deficiency that didn't make things very uh, easy on him at all. He was uh, not exactly an outcast, but he was a loner for sure. Mm -hmm. Just didn't have many friends. Um, he, uh, one of his aspirations in life was he dreamed uh, that um, one day he would be able to play the drums like uh, Buddy Rich. Mm -hmm. And he practiced, uh, except that his aspirations uh, seemed to be um, more than his actual talent. And he never did achieve that type of stardom. But he did uh, learn the drums well enough that he was asked by a man uh, to teach his uh, son uh, how to play the drums. And this man would later mold his life. The, the man's name was Robert Spitzer, who was a psychiatrist at the time and, and quickly became a father figure to this young man who had uh, very few friends in life. And uh, he willingly lit this young man all of his books on psychology. This ha happened, uh, seemed to be his niche in life. He started devouring these really books. Really took to it. He really took to it like a fish to water, as, as the saying goes. Now, Terry, should I, do I need to, to remind our people that even though they don't know who this individual is, to pay close attention oh, to the history of this man, because when they get to the end of this story and find out who this man is, it's going to blow them away. Blow them away. It will. Okay, and, carry and, on. And one thing, I'm glad you brought that up too, John, because one thing I need to stress is uh, folks will definitely want to get the documentation packet because we will in, include in its entirety this, this story article. out of the magazine yes. in its completeness, okay. along with pictures. Okay. So anyway, Spitzer, the uh, psychiatrist who had kind of taken this young man in, also introduced him to a, a, a pioneer family therapist by the name of Virgi uh, Virginia Satcher. And we'll get back to her just a little bit later, and we'll show you how she ties into all this, th all this uh, NLP stuff. Her messages of self-love and acceptance uh, just seemed to really hit his heart, something he really needed, and they became quick friends as well, and she kind of took him under her wing in a sort of a maternal way. After the uh, uh, young man graduated from high school in 1968, he enrolled in a nearby uh, junior coll uh, college and took uh, philosophy. He was uh, very he interested in that. His Natural. And, and the thing, this is where he started to blossom because in the environment of philosophy, he was able to freely speak his mind and he really enjoyed this. For the first time in his life, he wasn't afraid to just speak right out because this was the atmosphere that the environment had created. Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. He had moved uh, by now um, in the middle of this course to the hills of Santa Cruz, California, which is another place I used to go all the time. There at the boardwalk and uh, surf and so forth. So I'm very much familiar with the kind of a mindset that people have there is pretty open. Uh, the grassroots of uh, a lot of uh, uh, the drug, kind of like Haight Ashbury. Sure. That's what uh, Santa Cruz also imbibed in uh, in that uh, era. The people that knew this young man well uh, still felt that uh, he was not comfortable in the world. That's how they put him. That he was just kind, kind of a loner. A, just a loner. Even yeah. though he would speak his mind in certain environments. He, didn't have, he wouldn't, wouldn't attach himself to people. Didn't fit in. No, he just yeah. didn't quite fit in. He did uh, have some talent, though, in the area of uh, uh, communication and found out right away that uh, he, had, he had a profound impact by what he was learning on the, uh, not only the community, but the uh, therapists that had, uh, were beginning to understand what he was getting into. And they felt that um, 
what he was doing would have a lot of beneficial, um, well, just a lot of benefits to, to their uh, a way of thinking. Now, one thing that he did have, which was very uncanny, it was that he could mimic people with an uncanny accuracy. He could, he could just watch what they did. He could match their voice tones, their Impersonate. voice. He could uh, kind of like Rich Little or some of these impressionists that they can copy the person, their, their syntax, uh, their tone of voice, their mannerisms to where you absolutely. I will swear that that's the person themselves. Absolutely. Their, their voice structure, their mannerisms. It was, <coughs> it was similar to uh, like you might see a young man who has... Uh, not too much in life, but all of a sudden he's a prodigy of music. So he had a real talent in this area of just being able to mimic people. Flowed. Mm -hmm. Just flowed natural. out of him. Natural. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1970, this man decided that uh, psychology had begun, uh, become such a great love to him that he enrolled at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And although he wasn't interested in self-discovery as most psychology type of uh, kind of teaches, he, he liked to use his knowledge uh, that he had that came from uh, Virginia uh, Satter and also Fritz Perls to lead the guest talk groups, which were groups uh, that would uh, get in circles and discover their own needs, look to the inner self, and try to look for answers inside their own minds. Now, who are these people you just mentioned? You just mentioned their names. Who, 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 who are these people? Okay, Virginia, remember now, Virginia Satter was a leading family therapist at the time. Ah, so what, what are the years? What time? What, this was in 1970. 70s. Right. Okay. Uh, and then the uh, Fritz Perls was one of the people that founded the guest talk groups, which was... Uh, uh, group therapy. Okay. Sure. Okay, and was becoming very prevalent around 1970s. During the 70s. Yes, I do right. remember that. Now, this is also where he met uh, at, the, uh, at the University there of uh, Santa Cruz, a professor that took a very uh, liking to the young man because... There was a chemistry there that was kind of unique, and the professor's name was uh, uh, Richard, uh, excuse me, John Grinder was his name, and I'm sure that probably people okay. uh, know at least John Grinder has a lot to do with NLP. Of course. Okay. Uh, those who had uh, uh, kind of taken this kind of mindset with the professor and John Grinder and Virginia Satur and uh, Fritz Perls and these type of people in the immediate area all kind of uh, gravitated to this uh, well actually it was a uh, it was a property that used to be a nudist colony and then the uh, Robert Spitzer took it and turned it into a commune for these intellects where they could come and stay and just uh, do this uh, mind uh, uh, blazing trails uh, just get their heads together and try to sort these things out and perfect their techniques and so Te forth. Techniques of what? How to... How to get in, how, to, how people's mind works. Ah, okay. How, how they work. And they really got into this for a few years. Uh, those uh, at the commune that remembered this man that we're talking about, they remembered him as a very intense person and very temperamental. He had a hot temper and he would at certain times uh, really explode. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, it wasn't too long after he moved to, to the commune that the people on it asked Spitzer, the owner, to have him removed. And Spitzer, because he was such a violent person. Because he was a violent person. Mm -hmm. and, but Spitzer uh, refused because he knew his background. And so Spitzer sorry was the one that was in charge of this commune that had been a former nudist colony he that owned was now it. getting these people together to figure out how the mine worked. Absolutely. He, okay. he owned it. Also, it was at this time that the young man that we're talking about uh, started to brag about his heavy use of cocaine. So he was a heavy coke user. <coughs> yes, he was. Very heavy coke user and a drinker as well. Now, uh, while at the commune, uh, Professor Grinder and this man started an intensive study hoping to understand the techniques of linguistics. And how uh, both... Uh, what are linguistics, Terry? Well, linguistics are... Has to do with language. The professional use of language. Yes. Right. Very technical type dissection of how voice tones are used mm -hmm. and also not only just linguistics but the nonverbal use of body posture mm -hmm. and they got their heads together and uh, this was their uh, what, this was their child their brain child okay. and, and they focused completely on this uh, they also uh, at this time 
met, these two men met the renowned uh, psychiatrist, psychiatrist hypnosist Milton Erickson. And they begin to study Milton with him as Erickson. well. Milton Erickson. We talked about that on our first NLP video. Bill Lovelace talked about him, didn't he? Yes. So yes. here you have the professor of psychology. You have uh, John Grinder, one of the co-founders of uh, NLP. You yes. have this other young man that we're talking about. And you have Milton Erickson. They're all together, getting their heads together, Isn't trying to work out. You have the professor of linguistics, nonverbal communication with body posture, and the top dog of uh, hypnosis all coming together trying to work these techniques out in order to become uh, what we would call uh, magicians of uh, the therapy in the mind field. Mm -hmm. That's what okay. they were doing. Amen. And I have to say it is a mind field, John. Amen. I, I, <laughs> I get it. M-I-N-E? Yes. Uh, this quickly generated, as they were uh, perfecting their te techniques, quickly generated into an enormous amount of interest in their own uh, community, professional community. <coughs> and this would be the community of the uh, humanistic uh, uh, psychology. And uh, they, they took what was now known as neurolinguistic programming on the road. They decided that uh, uh, they were ready to take it on the road, start bringing people together and charging enormous sums of, sums of money. Uh, matter of fact, at this time, uh, the young man uh, was starting to uh, charge upwards to $4,000 a day. So he's making big money now with this. Big, big bucks. Mm -hmm. He started uh, uh, accumulating properties both here in the United States and I guess Hawaii is also part of the United States, but I think of it as an island. Uh, and on the islands over there. Uh, they, By giving these seminars oh, yeah. in uh, what, mind control? or Mind control, NLP, right, mm -hmm. mind control. Uh, what the audiences, uh, what actually brought them uh, to this young fella was that he was very stimulating. Uh, they saw them as being irreverent, uh, very funny. They were very outspoken in their criticism uh, toward the traditional therapy. Uh, during this time, is he still taking cocaine? Is he a heavy coke user during all this? We're going to get into that. Okay. Of course, the people didn't know that, but yes, very he much was so. heavily Absolutely. into a heavy drug user into cocaine. Absolutely. Being his drug of preference. Okay. Absolutely. Another thing that they absolutely delighted in doing was confusing their uh, audiences, and they would tell uh, their people uh, out and out that what we're about to tell you is a pack of lies. They would just tell them. They just absolutely love to just shock their audiences. And, and taunt them with the fact that they were being manipulated and lied to. A absolutely. Yeah. And what is um, kind of, well, for a better word, maybe twisted or warped about the human mind is the carnal nature. And I have to say, I I'm the same way if I don't keep my eyes on Jesus. Uh, our minds are so twisted, we kind of gravitate to that stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, if we think it's weird and strange, if it's weirder and stranger, the more we want to go see it. Yeah. You know, and so these people just started pouring in. Uh, although they weren't uh, therapists, actually, didn't have any PhDs in the area at all, they started treating clients and, and uh, calling themselves doctors and in their periodicals and books that they uh, wrote, uh, called themselves doctors all the time. And when they were questioned about that, they would just slough that off on their audiences and say, well, those people called us doctors and so yeah. that, we just go along with the flow. The um, <coughs> excuse me, man that we're talking about quickly developed a, quite a reputation. Uh, for being able to read people very quickly. He could see how you were, hear your voice structure, your tones, your body movements, and very quickly he could get right into your yeah. head. And the, the people were absolutely uh, fascinated yeah, that, by, his, by his Ooh. talent. Uh, he uh, was the type of person and had the type of personality that could put a person at ease almost immediately or scare you to death. He could do anything he wanted to oh, with you. It was like a, uh, uh, you'd be like a yo-yo on a string. He, he could, could wind you around, throw you in the air, toss you off the walls. He had the ability to control people against their will. Absolute. He, uh, he dazzled his audiences with his agile mind, his quick uh, wit, his skill as a, a hypnosis and a healer. And I thought that was very, very uh, significant. Very significant. Because we've said on the videos in the past that we'll be seeing healing in the church. Yes. And we said that before we knew about NLP. Yes. And now we're saying even harder. Yes. You know, I praise <laughs> the Lord that he's uh, vindicating his name Amen. in all of this. Uh, as the story goes, anyway, um, the uh, therapist, after they were taking a closer look at the NLP techniques, they were all very much interested in handling this material, incorporating it into the professional uh, community of what they did. And now, very much so, across the United States, and actually these folks are traveling around the world now, uh, it has been, uh, and, and we've showed some of this in uh, Loma Linda, mm -hmm. uh, it's being used 
in the medical uh, society because it works. Um, like the New Age philosophy that he'd learned, uh, he incorporated everything that he taught by uh, using uh, the therapy of constructed and reconstructed his own past. He would use NLP in his own past so many times to hide his own past that he himself, I believe, became confused about who he really was. And what he would do is he would, he would tell stories. And the stories uh, would go back into his past. He'd tell stories such as uh, that he uh, used to be a, uh, uh, a rock star. And he never was. But he would tell it just like he was. Couldn't even play the drums. <laughs> no, he, no, he tried, <laughs> but, but he never, but he could. He, uh, he would also tell stories that he uh, owned a topless bar at age 16 and became a millionaire at age 18. Mm. And none of that was true. This but, is what he was telling his audiences? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. He was telling them as a professional that that's his background, see, mm -hmm. to, to uh, get the power on his side. He uh, reconstructed stories so often, John, uh, he would go back into his own mind and do what they call reframing, reframe his own background. He'd become anybody he wanted to become. Another thing that's very important to know about this young man uh, is that the power of NLP gives a person the ability to take the guilt of something that you might have done in your past and slough it off by reframing your past so that you really didn't do that. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. And this is what he did quite often. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in his that's own mind. That's what reframing is all about, isn't that's it? That's exactly Absolutely. what it's all about. He also told stories that he had a black belt in karate, and having discussed pain control for the CIA and the Army... What control? Pain control. Oh, pain control. Pain control. Okay. He t told his audiences that he went to the CIA and discussed pain control with them and also the Army, and <coughs> excuse me, purportedly to prove his power, they had taken an agent out of the CIA and put an ice pick clear through the guy's hand to prove that NLP really worked. And he never flinched? No, never flinched. It was on Saturday morning, February 1984, when suddenly, almost magically, he produced a pistol while on stage in front of an audience right between the eyes of a psychiatrist who had volunteered to come up took out this revolver and just pointed it right at the guy. And it was, the point that he was trying to make was that anyone can change if he has the right stimulus. And the volunteer had said, the psychiatrist had disagreed with him, say. And here's the quote out of the magazine. This is the, young, the, the man talking now that's giving the NLP. He says, and he's, remember, he's got this gun pointed at this psychiatrist, real live gun. I've got news for you, he taunted. You've got no idea how nuts I am. How many people have one, talking about the gun, in their pocket, waiting for you? And you're going to tell me that I won't do it? He laughed. I don't have to kill you. I just have to wound you, he added. I've done weirder things to my clients. See, to get them to change. You didn't know that this was going to be real, did you? Now, can you imagine sitting there, this guy's got a loaded weapon in his hand, pointing it right between your eyes and being just dead serious with you. And he's already got this reputation. Sure, of being you know, weird. Of being weird and a reputation of violence. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the psychiatrist was visibly shaken. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, the change is possible. Of course, he succumbed, he surrendered. And this is when the other man said, absolutely. Otherwise, I would have shot you by now. You see, so he, he, was, he demonstrated, and then the, the audience laughed. Mm -hmm. You see, big joke. And, uh, of course, uh, then he went on to tell the audience to analyze, uh, analyze the dynamics of the psychiatrist's terror. You see, it was all just a big gimmick. Of course, the psychiatrist didn't know that. He also told a story about how he had gotten a woman who, who was afraid of heights to sing... Uh, he got into her mind and analyzed that she was afraid of heights because of some reason. So he got her to sing the uh, Star Spangled Banner while walking over to the edge of a, of a I don't know uh, how many stories it was, but uh, a large building to take away her fear. Then one time he also says that he had a um, schizophrenic in his office. And the schizophrenic thought he was Jesus Christ. This is the story in the article. And the, the, how he cured him was, is that this man built a cross and told this man in all seriousness that he was going to crucify him. And, of course, the man 
you know, yeah. was jarred out of that. And so you can see this man will go to any extreme. We're talking extremely kinky, weird guy. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Off the wall. Absolutely. Totally satanic, totally controlled by the devil, on cocaine, drug user, do anything, violent. Okay, carry on. Absolutely. Well, by 1986, coming closer to home now, this man was divided. He was at war with his own soul. Like I said, he'd gone so many times in the past, told so many lies, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then justified his lies. I didn't even know who he, who he was. <clears throat> he was living in a home built by his close friend. He finally got a close friend by the name of James Marino. He bought this home from his close friend, and he built this thing up like a fortress. I mean, it had eight-foot-high uh, fences around it, had a trained German shepherd, had uh, solid core doors on every room in the house with uh, dead bolts. Now, by this time, he's making head some heavy coin. This guy's oh, making yes, big money. Oh, yes, absolutely. Going around teaching these seminars, people had to get into other pe people's mind or what we know as NLP. Yes. He's got a small uh, arsenal, uh, several weapons, a semi-automatic weapon, knives in the house. He uh, makes uh, even his friends or his acquaintances or uh, people that he knows that come over every time they have to take a voice analysis before he'll let them come into the house. I mean, this guy is super paranoid. Uh, even though married at this time, he has a mistress, mistress that his wife knows about, and he tells her that she must be tolerated or there'll be problems. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we, I mean, this guy is just into everything. Still using uh, cocaine very heavily. Now, his close... A friend who he bought the house from, James Marino, had a girlfriend. Her name's Corrine Christensen. Corrine Christensen was a prostitute who had, uh, who ran a call girl service, exclusive call girl service. And even though she was 22 year, years younger than James Marino, he had such a personality that I guess she really fell in love with the guy. Was he using any of these techniques on her? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because you see, he one of the reasons he had become the friend of the man that we're uh, the story's about is because he. Uh, liked the power that the man welded and he wanted some of yes. it. Uh, James Marino had uh, said that he had ties with uh, the mafia. He was a cocaine dealer. So you see the marriage that was being made there. This guy wanted power of mind control. The guy that we're talking about wanted cocaine. So we have a, a, a real satanic twisted marriage going on here between these two fellows. Mm -hmm. uh, after uh, uh, in the same year, at the end of this uh, same year, 1986, Marino falls out of relationship with this gal and picks up another girlfriend and is talking about moving to Florida, actually, and, and moving his cocaine uh, business out to the so state. he's selling co cocaine. <coughs> oh, yes, he's a dealer. Mm -hmm. But Corrine's, Corrine had something else in mind. She was still in love with the guy and she didn't want him to leave. And she persuaded him uh, to take her to a Halloween party, which uh, was on October, let me see if I can get the date here, October 25th, 1986. Uh, and uh, which which he did get talked into that now not long after they went to this party for no apparent reason this big burly guy comes up to James Marino and just knocks his teeth out just mm -hmm. absolutely attacks him knocks his teeth out uh, puts a laceration under his right eye and just you know halfway beats his brains out just knocks him silly uh, Corinne Christensen gathers him up calls a taxi cab uh, rushes him off to the emergency room gets him revived and then takes him to her apartment and nurses him for the next three days. Well, I guess the assault really had an effect on him, and he uh, must have had a, a pretty bad uh, concussion because he had real bouts of, uh, during this time, he had real bouts of uh, tremendous headaches and dizziness. Uh, during this three day period at Corrine's house, uh, with these headaches and bouts of dizziness, he'd conjured up in his mind that she was the one that had planned to get him beat up and he became madder and madder. This James madder. Marino yes. began to imagine that it was his, this prostitute girl, girl, this, okay, this ex girlfriend who's a prostitute is the one that had conspired to have this big guy, was it at a bar? No, it was at a party. Uh, at, at a party to beat him up and he began to, in his mind, imagine that she was the one that had done this. Right. Okay. Uh, that never was proven, but... Did it, he have any thing to go on or no. just what he cooked up in his just mind? Just what he cooked right. up in his mind. Go on. And so while she was gone one day, he left her apartment and went uh, to the other girl that he was in love with now okay. Okay, and stayed with her for a few his days. His present girlfriend. Okay. Uh, a few days later on Saturday, November the 1st, 1986, he find, Marino finds himself in a restaurant and all of a sudden he has this big, 
big bout of dizziness. I mean, it's really, really on him. So he calls his friend, the, the man that we're talking about in the, the story man that here. You, this whole story is, the whole is about. about. Uh -huh. Now, he didn't know anything about what happened to James Marino because this has only been about a week and, and they hadn't seen each other. Okay. So he comes to the restaurant meeting James Marino, not knowing anything had gone on. That the previous fight. The previous okay. fight. Okay. He walks in and looks at his friend. And later on, he would say his only friend. What happened to and you? And man, I mean, it just hits him between the eyes. What had happened to you? His teeth are knocked his out. His teeth Start are knocked out. His stitches? back and okay. blue. He's like, you know, just looking he's really like bad. Half, he's half dead, okay. So even though uh, James Marino's voice was slurred and everything, he got out the story about what happened, and he put it on Kareem Christensen. Saying, my ex-girlfriend was trying to get revenge for me breaking up with her, and she had this big guy beating me up, and he had no... He had no uh, proof to say that he just assumed that yeah. she was the one that was behind all that. Absolutely. Okay. So this man that we're tell telling the story about, he gets super angry. He goes to the nearest phone and he calls Corinne Christensen, mm -hmm. and he tells her. He says, "I have I have a simple question to ask you. Who hurt my friend? Why is my friend hurt?" Well, for whatever reason, she started evading the questions. I, I you know, he's got this long track where of violence. She's probably getting scared. Sure. I don't know. But, <coughs> excuse me, she starts evading his questions and he says, okay, I've got two more questions to tell you, to ask you, until I blow your head off. That was what he told her. That was the last thing he told her on the phone. He goes back, gathers up Marino, and they go, end up at her apartment. Goes to her apartment. Her apartment. Now, this is where the testimony, the story gets a little fuzzy, John. Because what happens is this thing comes to trial. Okay, and there's a reason it comes to trial, and we'll tell that in a minute. But right now we're going to give the testimony about what Marino says. Okay, mm -hmm. Marino says that he and this man went to Corrine's house. When they got there, this man whips out a gun, a 357 Magnum, and holds it to the head of Corrine and starts yelling all kinds of obscenities. And, and it was so bad that Marino thought he was going to be killed as well. He was scared. And he started looking for a way to get out. But it was a second apartment, a second story apartment. Everything was buttoned down tight and he couldn't get out of the place. Mm -hmm. And so he came back to the living room. Shortly after he came back to the living room, this, the gun goes off. <coughs> and Corrine gets her brains blowed out. And she's down on the floor, blood all over the place. Okay. They leave. And the man... Okay, this is really gory, but they have great significance that our people understand this and the history of this man and you'll tell them at the end why. I'm gonna tell them and uh, they've I can't stress enough that they've got to get this story in the information packet It is crucial to the evidence that we've been uncovering okay but nonetheless uh, Marino s says that he and this man that the man took them to nearby Monterey now Monterey is about 35 miles or so from Santa Cruz okay they went to Monterey and the man made Marino take the 357 Magum and throw it off a pier Okay, now later on, uh, the police do collaborate some of his story. They find the gun, they send divers down, they do find the gun. And there was a few other things that Marino had said that they were able to uh, substantiate. There was a couple of things in his story, though, that was real hazy. And I'm not going to give all of those details because the people can read about it. And, and, and there's no sense in me telling all of it. Then the other man that we've been talking about, they put him on the witness stand. Now, you know, John, that... Uh, either through watching uh, TV or, or uh, a friend in court or whatever, that every time you go to court, one of the first things they do is uh, you have to raise your right hand, take the oath, sure. and then they say, state your name. Mm -hmm. So the other guy gets on, and of course they ask him to state his name. You know what his name was, John? His name was Richard Bandler. The founder, the founder of, of NLP, NLP. Richard Bandler. The man that we've been uncovering all this time. You know, we said there were two founders. Uh, John Grinder and Richard Banner. He's on all the books. He's on the first book, Frogs to Princes. This is the history. Transformation. This is the history of this man. This is the history, the life story of the father yep. and founder of Neuro Linguistic, Linguistic programming. programming. Right. God help us. Now he gets on stage. He gets on the uh, stand. Uh, the stand and tells a little bit different story. Okay. I'm not going to tell you how the trial ends up. You have to read it for yourself. But Terry, it's all printed. And we'll be in the documentation packet. Show me some pictures out of this now. Let's see some pictures of Bandler. Well, let me see. I can. Yeah, I'll show you a, a couple of pictures. Read here. some quotes out of this. Out of how many pages is 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 this story? It's about uh, six or seven pages. What's the name of the article? The Bandler Method. 
the Bandler method. Right. Here's a here's a copy. This is the one that they drew up. Maybe here's, I can show it here. Might be a little yeah, better better on camera. Richard Bandler. Look, yeah, notice he's right. got a notice. Yeah, notice he's got a brain in one hand and a gun in the other, and the blood splattered all over him. Right. And then. New Age therapists. I mean, they even come out and say that oh, yeah. neuro linguistic programming is New Age. I oh, mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just common knowledge. Mm -hmm. New Age therapist Richard Bandler believed that anyone could change with the right stimulus, even if that stimulus might be a gun. You have to remember that this magazine is not uh, a New Age magazine. No. It doesn't purport Here to religion. Here is an or actual picture of the father of neuro linguistic programming that oh. over two. Thousands, seven Adventist <coughs> ministers have been trained in, and hundreds have become instructors and trained other Seventh Adventist ministers, church members, church elders. By 1982, Richard Bandler was falling apart, drinking heavily and inhaling large amounts of cocaine. Still, he kept teaching NLP. We'll have to show the picture. It's impressive, isn't oh, it? Oh, <laughs> Terry, look at another uh, quote from this article. Brains were his toys. Mm -hmm. Bandler liked to say he compared humans to cars and computers and spoke of programming them. Yep. They love to confuse audiences, flout convention. Everything we're going to tell you here is a lie, they said. Hmm. Here, he's coming out of the courthouse. Alone. Oh. He's still teaching NLP. Oh, this whole, we're going we're gonna to reprint this whole article and put it in the documentation packet. Our people have to see this word for Absolutely word. Absolutely have to have it. Uh, it's, it's the father and founder of neuro-linguistic programming that is being promoted more by the Seventh-day Adventist church than any other church on the face of the earth. Right. And this is the founder and father of it. Right there, folks. I mean, this man is on the, the level man. of Charles Manson. And yeah. here we have this man, this founder and father of neurolinguistic programming. And do you really believe that our leadership will continue telling our people that somehow this is of God and that this founder and father of NLP, Richard Bandler, John Grinder, that this, that this somehow can be taken out of this satanic uh, f uh, foundation and, and make something holy out of it? You, you know what scares me, John? Unbelievable. What scares me <coughs> is that... We get these uh, ideas that when a person is being possessed by the devil, he's got to be something like uh, poltergeist or, or out of uh, uh, the exorcist or something. Something really ugly and strange. Not necessarily. The, the devil comes in and possesses people and makes them look real intellectual. He himself is an intellectual, only, only second to the Godhead. And, and this is what he's doing. He's giving these, these people that have these strange backgrounds, these backgrounds of uh, promiscuity, these backgrounds of heavy drug use, these backgrounds of, uh, of uh, violence, these backgrounds of uh, mayhem, and these sort of things. He's given them intellectual knowledge and then used them in the professional society to gain control of the minds, not only of the people out there that don't care anything about God, but of our people inside our very church. We've just had an extensive interview with Bob Trans. Mm -hmm. He's traced all this, shown how all this ties in together with the, with the uh, conspiracy of uh, the Roman Catholic Church to bring all Protestant churches back to the Mother Church. Uh, foremost, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. How that these New Age techniques of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, now you have shown our Adventist people the founder and father of Neuro Linguistic Programming, yeah. where it all comes from. Yeah. This is absolutely mind-boggling. We've given our people so much information. I appreciate the research that you have done in bringing this to us, Terry. I don't know if you have anything in closing and dealing with this N NLP, but I want you now to go into what is the update on what is going on in your old church at Shady Point, Oregon? Give us a quick uh, 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 tightening this, uh, tightening, cap it. Re that's the word I want, mm -hmm. to, to, to cap this story of Richard Bandler, the founder of NLP, and then get into the situation at Shady Point. Well, you know, we brought this book up on one of the other videos, Becoming a Master oh, Student. Oh, yes. And we're going to show some footage uh, of a couple of things uh, that will help tie this all together. But in the back, we had a friend that said, you need to look at the back of the book. In the back <laughs> of the book, in the bibliography. Now, what's the bibliography? Give the definition for bibliography. Well, the bibliography, according to the dictionary in layman's terms, means anything that you would use from different authors to use as resource material. Yes. Okay? And so in the back of uh, the Becoming a Master Student book, you have the bibliography, and it names the different authors and books that they used. 
Now, let's, let's just make it real clear here. These books that are given under the bibliography in the back of Becoming a Master Student, which is taught at, at many of our colleges, and we have even found more colleges than what was listed on our original that are teaching from, from uh, Becoming a Master Student, that this is the source material, source material that was used to put together on Becoming a Master Student. Read it. Well, i just got to tell you that the very second uh, person listed is Richard Bandler and John Grinder, Frogs and the per Princes, Neurolinguistic Programming. So, this man right here, this, this sicko on the level with Charles Manson, mm -hmm. that was the father and founder of Neurolinguistic Programming, was part of the source material that made up on becoming a master student. Yes, and remember Virginia Satire that I told you about that took him under uh, his arm yes. and, and, and taught him some yes. things? She's also one of the source material right here. She's also the source material. Now, I'm going to bring in somebody new. Okay. <coughs> and we're going to show some footage on this that we have. But Kathy and I, uh, you know, uh, we're from Oregon. Yes. Not anymore. But <laughs> You're from Florida <laughs> now. from Florida now. <laughs> uh, and glad to be. Amen. But uh, we were in Oregon at the time. And in Oregon, there was a guru that came. And his name was uh, the Bhagwan Roshnish. Oh, everybody saw him and his oh, yes. all his Rolls Royces years. That's yes, right. he had a hundred Rolls Royces. Right. He would come and go through a uh, drive in the red. Rolls Royce yeah. and wave, and everybody would be in red. Well, guess what? He's also used as one of the sources, and he's right here. And we're going to show the people Rashnish. some footage about what kind of mind control he's in. And I'm telling you, it is sick. Okay, you've got some video got some showing. Video. Uh, this the is commune at, at the uh, commune, Rashnish, and yep. he, he is part of the source material that I'm becoming a master student. Absolutely. So let's now view uh, the um, uh, home of Bhagwan Rashnish, part of the source material for becoming a master student. Rajneesh is one of India's most controversial gurus, largely because of his endorsement of shocking sexual practices as a prerequisite for salvation. His brand of yoga called Dynamic Meditation is a New Age combination of Hinduism and psychotherapies. This exercise involving rigorous breathing and hyperventilation is designed to arouse the serpent force called Kundalini, which the gurus believe lies coiled at the base of the spine. I did dynamic meditation every day. We also called it kundalini meditation. It starts off with a cathartic breathing. And the reason for it is just to move your energy and to get you out of your head and into your body. And you just breathe. The next phase, the screaming phase of dynamic meditation, feels like when you finally had an opportunity to throw a tantrum when you were a little kid. By the time you get to the third phase of jumping up and down and yelling who, you're hardly there at all. And so it's pretty hard to remember what happens when you're there. I guess the closest thing I can associate it with is mindlessness. You get to a place where your mind actually leaves your body. Your body's just jumping up and down and your voice from your gut is yelling who, and you're not doing it anymore. You become one with this whole energy. The next phase in dynamic is a quiet space. Someone yells, stop, and you've just been doing 30 minutes of intense catharsis. And what happens after being in such incredibly intense movement for so long is just a feeling of peacefulness and stillness. My mind actually stops, and I feel a oneness with the whole universe. 
There have been glowing reports published giving credit to the gurus and their pseudo-psychological techniques, but neglecting to mention the thousands of cases of emotional and mental breakdowns, insanity, suicide, beatings, murder, rapes going on in guru centers, various guru centers worldwide. It is alarming to realize these dangerous techniques for enlightenment are being incorporated in psychotherapies, self-help seminars, and are even being accepted in mainstream Protestant and Catholic churches and seminaries. Well, that was very interesting. I believe that our Adventist people are beginning to see things as they are. And if they can't, I don't know what more we can do, Terry. Well, like we've always said, video don't lie. And if the people just saw it was on the video, you have to literally be out of your mind to follow these just guys. Just like those people were. That's right. Unbelievable. This is the, this is the source, material. source material. Instead of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, this is the source material we are going to to train our students in our Seventh-day Adventist colleges. God help us. What have we, we become? See, we're not just going to Babylon and drinking no, up their wells. No, this is worse than we're Babylon. Going, we're going to the sewers this of the occult. This is the sewer of the occult. I yeah. like it. That's, That's exactly what exactly it is. What Instead of going to Babylon and the broken cisterns, we've gone to the sewers of, of the, the occult. occult. And we're just drinking freely. It's like it was pop. Unbelievable. It is. Give us an update now on Shady Point here. Well, I uh, called uh, one of my friends out there a couple of weeks back and what has happened since uh, we've left is of course they've stripped everybody that uh, refuse because of their conscience refuse to prove that they were paying tithe to the local church which would be Shady Point and to the local conference if you cannot now now you and uh, Bob mentioned this earlier that you would have to show your checkbook to yeah. prove that you're paying the money to yeah. the church. That's one of the Catholic techniques. Well, this is exactly control. this is exactly what uh, Phil Dunham told me and Kathy. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I questioned about it. I said, "Now wait a minute." I said, "You, you got, you're telling me that you will not take a Christian man's word, whether he's a tithe payer. I have to, I have to show you a receipt to prove what I'm saying." He said, "That's right, or you cannot hold office this in this is church." A Catholic technique. Mm -hmm. Bob showed that it's right <laughs> out of right out of Catholic history of the methods that they use for control of the lady. Now, in that celebration number seven, video number seven, mm -hmm. we saw Elder Phil Dunham had been sent down from the conference and it looked like that you all routed him pretty good. And, and he left kept, the next day. Yeah. But <laughs> now you say, since you have left, that they have come in yes. and have taken control and, and gotten out of office all the people who dared to stand against them. How did they do that, Terry? Well, they just stripped them and would not allow them to get up front or anything like that. Then they went one step further. Why did they allow that to happen? Well, I'm not there, so I don't know. Uh, I will say this, though. Uh, they went one step further, and I, I just got to say, they tried to do this uh, in another class that I was in once before, and I didn't let it happen. So I can say in all Christian conscience, I wouldn't have let it happen without a fight. And yet I'm not there, So I, and, I, and I know the backgrounds of these people, and, and they're doing the best they can under the circumstances, so I, I don't want to discourage them. And, but although I've got to encourage our people that they've got with a free conscience to take a stand uh, for the truths that Jesus Christ has left Amen. us as Adventist people. Amen. Our prophet told us that this time would come, Terry. It's time Amen. for God's people to stand up. You know, 3RH275, look what she says. If the cords are drawn much tighter, if the rules are made much finer, if men continue to bind their fellow laborers closer and closer to the commandments of men, Many will be stirred by the Spirit of God to break every shackle and assert their liberty in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. That time is now. Right it's now. time right now, now for God's people to stand up and to assert their liberty in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Amen. That reminds me of what uh, Bob read earlier about Luther. Call me anything you want, yeah. but I'm going forward if That's it's by right. myself. Not because we're prideful, not because we think we're anybody, but because we know who Jesus Christ is and we know the time Amen. in which we live. So you know, what's happening to the, to the Shady Point Church? Well, now? what they did after they stripped these uh, folks of all their uh, church, uh, offices. church offices and, and just would not allow them to even think about uh, getting involved in a personal way anymore, the, I guess the uh, next thing they did was come right into their Sabbath school class. Yeah. Now, they had already stripped the Sabbath school teacher of, uh, of that class, of, of his office. Yeah. And the, I guess the pastor and the doctor came in and uh, just told this class that 
they couldn't have a teacher anymore, and they said, well, that's okay, we'll just all teach each other. And then they uh, came back again, and they just told them, no, you can't. You are not allowed. You're not going to be allowed to have a class anymore. You are out of here. Uh, you have to come back into the main sanctuary and get under the organized classes. We are not going to allow you to congregate back here and keep, you know, stirring up amongst yourselves. <coughs> now, I have to admit that if I had been there, John, and I have done this once before, I would have told that doctor, by the way, this is the same doctor that faxed his vote in from Arizona to get me kicked out of that church. fellowship. Faxed it in, yeah. But uh, I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I would have told this doctor that, uh, you know, uh, either sit down and learn something or go back in the other room because we weren't budging. Yeah. And they would have had to, you know, I don't know, sometimes uh, we shouldn't fight, but there's other times when you, you just can't give the church away, you know. But I wasn't there. What happened was, was they decided to uh, meet in a... Uh, a grange that's uh, not too far away from the church and actually at this time John unless things have changed within the last week uh, they have more people that are coming out of Shady Point Church they have more people coming to their meeting at the grange than they left in the church and so now the few people that are conference they have what I call conference cancer they're having to support let's say okay support it then if you're gonna do it and run it run it and the other people they're bringing in speakers and, and they're uh, congregating there at the grange and and carrying on. You know, I know that uh, the Oregon Conference leadership is watching this video. Don Jacobson has said that he yeah. watches all the videos that come out of this yeah. ministry. And I might say this while you're mentioning this, if he's going to watch it, and that is, I've already heard threats that they're going to try to remove my membership without telling me. Uh, now, that's the same thing that Bob Catholic, said. Catholic uh, method of so doing things. So we're aware of this in, you know. I just want to tell the Oregon Conference leadership, you may think that you have won the battle, at Shady Point, but you have lost the war. Yeah. You know, all all that you are doing is waking up the Adventist laity. That is all. You are waking up a sleeping giant. I just watched Torah, 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 uh, uh, the um, documentary on the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor. This week, December 7, 1991, is the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And you know, Admiral Yo Yomamoto uh, said uh, when the planes were coming back to the carriers from Pearl Harbor, he turned to his assistant and said, I'm afraid all that we have done is awakened a sleeping giant. And let me tell you, conference men, something. All you have done is awaken the sleeping giant of the Adventist laity, and you are going to lose the war. I promise you. You have no idea the sleeping giant that you have awakened. The days of the Adventist laity standing up and asserting their liberty in Christ Jesus and no longer allowing this, this conference tyranny of coming in and controlling the laity. Those days are over. They may have won a battle at Shady Point, but they are going to lose the war. You know, John, what excites me, uh, and I must, I, I must say, uh, I've said it at least a dozen times, the, the historic Adventist heart will break a thousand times between here and the gate. That's right. It's going to happen. We're going to be disappointed. Nobody likes to see what's going on. I, you know, my heart breaks to see our beloved church do what it's doing. But on the other side of the coin, what excites me, John, is we're about ready to see God work for Amen. His people. And though we may be fewer in number, we are stronger in, in the, in, uh, on the battlefield. Not because we are anybody, but because we know that we're not anybody and we know somebody that's everybody. Testimonies to Ministers, page 300. God's prophet says that we will be amazed. God's people will be amazed in the last days. When God takes the reins into his hands, right. the simple means that he uses to perfect his work in righteousness. Right. We're seeing that right now. And God is going to use simple means by men from, and women from every walk of life. The laity are going to finish this work. We are going to have to be the ones to preach the three angels' message to the world. We are going to be the ones that God is going to raise up right. to finish this work. Because if not us, who? If not now, when? It's now and it's us, John. Terry, thank you for the research you've done, bringing us up to date. I want you to lead us in prayer at the closing of this, of this video. Let's kneel. Heavenly Father, once again we come to you admitting our weaknesses, knowing we are but mere dust. Lord, we so appreciate that we serve a loving God who watches and cares over the least of His children. And Lord, even though we're not worthy of the battle, we know that your son is. We ask that you would give us, your people, the courage, the fortitude it takes 
at this time to take a stand. Help us not to deny our faith. Help us not to be ashamed. But help us to be, in the right sense, proud. Help us to know what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, the highest calling that any human being can receive. Help us to be simplistic enough to follow Thee every step of the way. Lord, we even pray for our enemies. Somehow, if it can happen, we ask that You would turn things around, at least in individuals. We know that there are good men in the camp. We even know that there are Saul's in the camp that will eventually become Paul's. But Lord, help us to see the times in which we live and help us to pick up that blood-stained banner and march forward. Yes. Bless your people now as we close this tape. May they have the knowledge that you want them to have. May we have the balance that we need. May we have the discernment to walk through this minefield. Yes. And may we keep our eyes on the bigger picture. And one day soon, see your son, Jesus, come in the clouds of heaven. For we pray these things in his precious name. Well, I just want to tell our viewers that um, they need to get this documentation package. Absolutely. I'm not a huckster. I'm not trying to sell anything, folks. But you need to get this article on Richard Bandler. You need to get all the material that Bob Trevs has shown us uh, for a, a $10 gift to this ministry or more. We'll, we, you need to have this documentation packet. And, you know, you've watched many of these videos. I'm sure that they know our, our address. But it's Prophecy Countdown, Box 1844. Don't you like that box number? I like that. <laughs> kind of rings a bell. <laughs> box 1844, Grand Island, Florida. And the zip is 327... Oh, no. Three five. Three five. Thank you. I keep getting Mount Dora mixed up with uh, Grand Island. Three two seven three five. And uh, let us hear from you folks. We really appreciate your words of encouragement and your letters and your support for us. Terry, thank you for for being here, my brother in Christ that I, that I just love and appreciate so very much. It's good working with you, and we're going to keep our Adventist people updated with what is going on. Let me, let me tell, let me say this just right at the very end. Little old Ryan that wrote the letter. Yeah. Ryan, I never knew it could be so good. <laughs> Bless your heart. Thank you, Terry. Don't hit that rewind button yet. There's a whole lot going on real fast, folks, that you need to know about. We'll bring you up to date at the end of the credit roll in just a few moments, so stay tuned. some important new information that Bob Trevs need to bring you up to date on that we have to let you know. Bob's on the phone. I want him to tell you. John? Yes. Bob Trevs is on line one. Thank you. Hello, Bob. This is John Osborne. Hi, John. How are you? I'm just fine. Appreciate so much you calling. I tell you, I can't believe the stuff that has happened just in the short time since we have videotaped together in the, in the studio here. Now, we taped uh, this is the first week of December. It's now the first week in January. The holidays kind of set us back. But we're ready to take this edited master to the duplicators, but just found out that you have got some new startling information. How about bringing us up to date before we finish this tape? Sure, John. Uh, we have had a mass of activity going on. We published in October in Freedom's Ring the fact that a prominent SDA systematic theologian representing the SDA church had signed, along with Roman Catholics and a hundred theologians, the most significant ecumenical document the World Council of Churches has ever produced, right. calling for the unity of the churches in the fields of baptism, Eucharist, and ministry. Yes. And, of course, this is of great interest to 
Adventists because Ellen White says in uh, Great Controversy 444-445 that uh, there is a growing sentiment in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. And then a little later she says when this shall be gained, then in the effort to secure complete con uniformity, it will be only a step to the resort to force. That's exactly where we are. And uh, she says, when the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then a Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy. What page in Great Controversy that? Was is that was 444, 445. Yeah. And that's why this is so significant, because the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry document is the most significant document that the World Council of Churches has ever produced. And we got our material, our information, from the back of the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry document. I sent down that uh, document to you, John. I'm holding it right here in my hand, Bob. Okay, I, I think it's important to even look at, at what is on the back page there, uh, including each of those little short paragraphs. Yes. It says, the statement published here marks a major advance in the ecumenical journey, the result of a 50-year process of study and consultation. This text on baptism, Eucharist, and ministry represents the theological convergence that has been achieved through decades of dialogue under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So they're acknowledging that this is the the great uh, development in yeah. ecumenical convergence. you got to read the next paragraph. Right, the next one. Over 100 theologians met in Lima, Peru in January 1982. And, John, I have the uh, report of the Commission on Faith and Order in uh, Lima, Peru, right in my hands here. It's called Towards Visible Unity, the Study Papers and Reports. And I counted the number. There were 105 uh, theologians that were there gathered. You've got that document in your hand? Well, I have the report of the study papers and reports made at Lima, Peru. Where did you get all that? Oh, from the World Council of Churches. Bless your heart. Anyway, reading on there, John, it says they recommended unanimously... Unanimously. Unanimously, right, to transmit this agreed statement. That means everyone that was there. The Lima text for the common study and official response of the churches. Now, I'm holding... You can't see me right now, John, but <laughs> I'm holding in my hand the Faith and Order, 1985 to 1989, Commission Meeting at Budapest, 1989. And in the back of that, it lists the members on the Faith and Order Commission. And Dr. Raoul Dederen, Seventh-day Adventist Church, SDA yeah. Theological Seminary, Andrews University, Berrien Springs, Michigan, is listed there yes. as one of the members of that commission. So... Uh, he was our, he's been on that commission for years. And they u recommended unanimously to transmit this agreed statement for the common study and official response of the churches. They represented virtually all, all the major traditions. All the major church traditions. Now notice they include the Adventists among major church traditions. Printed just as big as life, right here. Right. Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Old Catholic, Lutheran, Anglican, Reformed, Methodist, United, Disciples, Baptist, Adventist, and Pentecostal. But what about our leadership, Bob, that are denying this? Well, that's what I want to get into. Let me just read this last paragraph. The church's response to this agreed statement will be a vital step in the ecumenical, ecumenical process, of, process reception. of reception. And we have responded uh. to that document. It's in Volume 2 of Churches Respond to BEM. And uh, it's, it, the response is by the Council on Interchurch Relations. Well, what happened, John, that was so interesting was someone read our paper out on the West Coast and wrote to a certain independent ministry... And they had, even though we didn't name Dr. Detteran's name in the paper, uh, they suspected that it was he. Mm -hmm. And this independent ministry wrote directly to Dr. Detteran and asked him about it because they had a, uh, a letter from B.B. Beach dated April 2 of 1982, which would be just a few months after January, yes. which stated that he abstained from voting on the document. And yet the BEM document says it was unanimous. Somebody's lying here, Bob. So he wrote this letter to Dr. Dutteran, and then there's a note at the bottom of the letter that I received, December 5, 1991, Dr. Dutteran called and stated that he signed no papers nor the document itself. 
And uh, so, not, 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 so not only Dr. Does... Dutter and also confirmed that he abstained in the vote on the document, as did some others. Well, that really perplexed us, and uh, because the World Council of Churches has gone on record in the back of this book stating that the Adventists were involved. So we began doing some checking on things. And I got up a little after one in the morning and called the World Council of Churches in Geneva, Switzerland, and talked to the Faith and Order Department there and asked them if they had a list. And, John, I faxed that telefax down to you. It came in at 4 o'clock that morning yes. from Switzerland yes. from Dr. Gunther Gossman's office. He's the director of Faith and Order currently at the World Council of Churches. And it says, Dear Mr. Trest, in answer to your telephone call of this morning, I'm happy to send you the list of participants in the 1982 Lima Faith and Order meeting who have unanimously adopted the BEM document. Gudrun Smith, the secretary, signed it. And as we were watching the facts, we noticed the names coming out, and they're as big as life in the first column was Dr. Detteran's yeah. name, Dr. R. Detteran. In fact, Dr. Gunther Gossman, I called him a day or two later and talked to him further, and he said he had checked the minutes and it was unanimous. Uh -huh. In that phone call where I talked directly to Dr. Gunther uh, Gossman, the director of the World Council of Churches, who would be one of the more powerful men in the World Council of Churches, he told me the vote was unanimous. Every person in the room voted in favor of it. There were no abstentions, he said. So everybody was voting for it. There was nobody in that room who abstained. And he says since that time, nobody has contested the fact that the vote was unanimous, and it's been in print now for years on the back of the BEM document. Any church that did not want to appear as having been involved unanimously with this vote would surely have contested that fact some time ago. But Bob, in, here is this document from the World Council of Churches, yet our leadership has been, has been telling us that we have nothing to do with the World Council of Churches and are not members and are not involved in all this. Now, Bob, uh, are we being lied to? Have we been lied to? What is going on, Bob? Let's just come right out and spell it. Our people need to know. Well, all right. I, I press the matter then with uh, Dr. Gossman, uh, and uh, I even brought up Dr. Detteran's name because I wanted to get to the bottom of this thing. And uh, he told me in the course of the conversation a number of other things. He said all the members of the Faith and Order Commission serve in a personal capacity. Now, it has been admitted that we have a person seated in a personal capacity on this commission, but the, impl the inference that I always got from that was that everyone else was there in an official capacity. But now I find out that all of them serve in a personal capacity. The voting, he said, is not a juridical, legally binding matter for the churches that the, uh, that the members represent, and an affirmative vote means that the document is accepted in in principle or agreed with in principle, not necessarily in all its details. Okay, let me see if I understand this, Bob. We have been told by the leadership at the Seventh Avenue Church for years now that we are functioning in the World Council of Churches, but in a in a personal, unofficial is that the terms? Well, that's the implication that a person would get a personal and a, a, a personal role on the. A personal role. But, but that's exactly the same as everybody but, but else. That's what, every, that's what everybody with the World Council of Churches functions in a personal role. Nobody is there uh, representing a church per se. They're working in a functional, I mean, in a personal role. So really this has just been a smokescreen. We have been involved in the World Council of Churches for years, and our people have been misled, and may I even say it, we have been lied to. Well, uh, also, John, if you check the directory of the World Council of Churches, you'll find that we have membership or associate membership or observer status in at least 13 nations, uh, national branches of the World Council of Churches. Uh, I counted them one time some months ago. And also we have had a representative on the uh, World Confessional Families 
branch of the World Con uh, Council of Churches, which is a very powerful branch of the World Council of Churches. And all that the World Council of Churches is, and everything that we have been involved in, is the Seventh Adventist all these years, is the Protestant Reformation in reverse. It totally negates the Three Angels' message. We have been called forth by God to pe call people out of Babylon and to separate from Babylon. And all that the World Council of Churches is, does is, is promote ecumenicalism, which is the Protestant Reformation and negates the Three Angels' message and totally countermands everything we believe in the three angels' message. It's completely the opposite of the second and third angels' messages as well as the first, as well as the loud cry. So this is, and John, this all ties in with these trademark lawsuits, of course. Absolutely. Too. Bob, we shouldn't be having anything to do with this in the first place. Well, that's exactly... How insane! We've lost our minds. Our, our leadership have changed leaders, and they don't even know it. Well, John, we have uh, still now on the records. Then uh, we don't know exactly. We weren't present. There was no video camera, but we do have on the record the record of the World Council of Churches that uh, Dr. Dettern was a participant in the unanimous vote. That's on that fax I sent you. Yes. We have the statement that the Adventists were involved yes. in the unanimous decision on yes. the back of the BEM document. Yes. We also have a personal witness in Europe who, read, who told me over the telephone, I called him in Europe, and he told me that he had read in the German-speaking Adventist paper the, uh, an article in which it stated that uh, Dr. Detteren had voted in favor of the BEM document. Yes. And he went on to tell me how when he was in America, he went to Dr. Detteren and he said, how could you do this? How could you go along with these men who are opposed to us? And Dr. Detteren admitted privately to this man that he had voted in favor of it, but he said in his heart he was in disagreement with the document. Let me tell you something, Bob. The thing that our historic Adventist people have to realize is that we have been lied to, and we've been lied to for years. And I know that is painful. I am a third-generation Adventist. I love this message. But we have got to realize that we have been lied to by our leadership. And it's about time that our historic Adventist people woke up and started investigating things instead of just accepting the word of these men and realize that we have been led down the primrose path. John, this man then went to the Union office in Vienna, Austria, to find that article, and when he got there and got into the archives, those that set of documents was missing. Isn't that amazing? Bob, give us an update on the situation with uh, the CAST yearbook at Andrews University. Here, something happened about that. Okay. I was, uh, I was just talking to someone up at Andrews, and they told me that the day after the CAST came out, there were 50 to 100 black and Hispanic seminary students that were so outraged by it that they wanted to have a public bonfire burning Amen. of the cast. Bless their hearts. And uh, some uh, Koreans, I think, were also involved in now, that. Now, we've got Koreans, we've got the Hispanics, and we've got the blacks. Where are all these little mamby-pamby white boys at? Why aren't they doing something? Oh, Why this, are they such this, chickens? This man told me that... Uh, there were some other uh, pastors in training at the seminary who saw absolutely nothing wrong with it. In fact, they saw it as commendable and uh, that it was wonderful that it had a spiritual motif. Yeah, right. And spiritual so motif. what's interesting then, uh, John, is that in the teeth of this uh, growing unrest about uh, the cast on the part of a few people uh, at Andrews, uh, the pastor, the senior pastor, Dr. Dwight, Dwight Nelson. Nelson. I've got this, I've got a copy of his sermon right here. He told a committee that he was going to publicly defend this uh, magazine and support it. And then he entered the pulpit November 23rd and over the 50,000 watt station at Andrews, which broadcasts all over Michiana for a great distance, including Notre Dame University, which is about a 45-minute drive away. He publicly supported this magazine to the skies. Well, Bob, I tell you, I've got that tape in my hand. I appreciate uh, you having it sent to me. Uh, I think our folks at home need to hear a few minutes of this. This is uh, Dr. Dwight Nelson, senior pastor of the Pioneer Memorial Church at Bering Springs, Michigan. You need to hear this, folks. Since this is a Thanksgiving season, I want to take a moment right here at the beginning to express a word of thankfulness 
concerns this little uh, production I hold in my hands. Those of you that are students in the university, Andrews University, recognize this as the 1991-92 cast. If you have not seen this production, and most of you in the community have not, you cannot appreciate the incredible design work that went into making this particular cast a reality. I've appreciated all of our casts, but in particular, this one that chose a religious motif for its theme. My hat is off to Joffrey Isaac and the entire team who are listed here in the cover of this uh, production. Masterful, appropriate indeed for this institution and this Christian campus. In fact, last service, first service, I wrote a note. We'll all have a chance in a moment to write notes, but I wrote it to Joffrey. Dear Joffrey, just a note to let you know how much I appreciated your production and design of the cast this year. Super. The religious motif naturally impressed me as your pastor on this campus. Tasteful, pertinent, and right on for a Christian university. God bless you in all your creative endeavors in the future for him. Peace. And I signed it. I do thank Joffrey and his team. Job well done. Thank you. Oh, that was uh, very enlightening, to say the least. Uh, what else do you have for us, Bob? Well, John, you know, we mentioned about uh, Dr. William Lovelace teaching the spiritual exercises to the ministers and workers meeting. What's the latest with that? And he's been, of course, traveling around promoting this. We got some material in the mail, which was the uh, part of a seminar that he was giving on Friday nights at Loma Linda, entitled Lessons in Contemplative Prayer. It happened in July, and on the back page of the handout, there as big as life is the rec reading list for Christian meditation and contemplation, and there is Ignatius Loyola right on the list, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, and that's the training manual for the Jesuit order. Yeah. So there is absolutely black and white evidence of direct promulgation of the training manual of the Jesuits right there. Bob, I just received a letter from a woman uh, that was a professional hypnotist before she be found the truth and came into the Seventh Adventist Church, and she says when she saw uh, the New Age Adventism Part 1 and heard that tape of Bill Loveless, she gasped in disbelief. She says this is absolutely hypnotism in its highest form she says she recog she said and she went through and just and just outlined all the steps that bill loveless was doing and she was a professional hypnotist before she came to the lord isn't that something? it's incredible bob the yeah. stuff that's happening yet our people are so reluctant to admit this stuff and and they listen to our leadership because i want to tell you in case you don't know there has been such an unbelievable attack launched against the independent ministry since we have begun bringing out this information and uh, we haven't seen the worst of it by any means. So batten down the hatches, Bob, because we've sure uh, stirred up a hornet's nest, to say the least. John, also on that reading list, there is a, a book by William Johnston, who is a Jesuit living over in Japan, who is affiliated with Sophia University. Yes. Uh, he is a Jesuit there, and so his book is in there. And also, St. Teresa, The Complete yes. Works of St. Teresa is yes. another book. She is one of the greatest mystics of the Roman Catholic Church. Bob, we're getting down to the end of, uh, and not only the end of time, but the end of this tape. We're going to have to bring this thing to a close. But I appreciate so much you calling and updating us at the end of this tape before it goes to the duplicators and keeping our people abreast of what is going on. May okay. God bless you in your work. God bless you too, John. It's been wonderful working with you. Thanks, Bob. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.